So uh, thank you again for, for being with us. Uh, my name is Joshua. I'm the Music Librarian at Houston Grand Opera. I'm joined by Mark Fugina, who's with the Long Beach Symphony. Uh, and then I'm also joined by Philip Rothman of New York City Music Services and thousands of other exciting ventures uh, that he takes part in. So welcome. Uh, we are going to be discussing audition music preparation. Uh, the, the focus of, of this is primarily different technical aspects for actually creating excerpts and compiling them. So our goal is to kind of showcase those. Some of them may be new to you. Some of them may be optimizations of, you know, long held uh, approaches to it. Um, we're gonna discuss some basics just to make sure everything is covered. Uh, one of the best in-depth resources for all, you know, all of the nuts and bolts about what is needed in preparing excerpts is in Russ Gersberger's and, and Laurie Lake's uh, book, The Music Performance Library. Uh, definitely encourage you to read it and reread it very often. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource by, by wonderful people. So with that being said, we will start at the beginning. So the basics for audition excerpts really comes down to communication within your organization. Uh, prior to compiling the excerpts list, you need to make sure that you're working, developing and maintaining lines of communication within your organization. So it, figuring out you know, who on the committee is going to be the main person coordinating the list of excerpts there, who within your organization is going to be the main person communicating with them. Is it a music administrator? Is it a personnel manager? You know, uh, once you really know who your people are, you can know the pipeline to ask any questions which need to be asked. Is there a certain addition which really needs to be specified? Are there any, you know, very problematic errata that a music director or, you know, a principal a principal violin is going to want to have a say in before you know the librarian uh, corrects something. This is also the best time to start asking questions before things perhaps get uh, left in the cracks. So certainly the asking early about any sight reading excerpts or section playing excerpts ahead of time would be good. This is something that is almost always you know the last line on an audition excerpt is that there might be sight reading and it's something that sometimes a committee, you know, may neglect until the audition day. So it's good to be upfront about that so that you are prepared and not put in an awkward position. Uh, another thing in knowing your people and the people in your pipeline is just foreseeing the possibility of, of perhaps needing slightly longer excerpts uh, just in case um, as anybody wants to expand the scope of an excerpt before it's actually uh, uh, pushed out to for for applicants. Um, so keeping those things in mind, and just knowing knowing who you're working with and, and what their needs and timelines might be. Sure. So the excerpt list is is the first and foremost thing in the booklet. Uh, obviously, it needs to include your organization name, the audition position, the date of audition. Uh, and then you're in order, you're going to include any required solo selections and all excerpts, which are usually going to be alphabetical by composer last name, and then any additional requirements. And that's sight reading and section playing or anything else that your organization uh, might, uh, might require. Um, you know, most of this presentation is based around the idea that your organization is providing all excerpts, um, but if you're only providing some of them, such as uh, copyrighted excerpts, which you've had licensed, then just indicate there which ones will be provided and which ones will not. Uh, and then a very important note is that if the audition requires any doubling instruments or certainly percussion auditions, the excerpts really need to be ordered uh, by instrument. Uh, this will just not only be a quality of life thing for the applicants, but once it comes time to uh, doing the rounds, it will be very easy to, to delineate that for uh, logistics. So as far as acquiring excerpts, your four options really are going to be scanning from your own collection, which could be from uh, complete works or a separate excerpt library that you've, you've had. Um, you know, IMSLP remains a great resource, although these are obviously, you know, uncorrected, you know, scans, uh, which will need to be properly tended to. If it's a copyrighted work, you're gonna to have to request a license uh, from a licensing agent. And then uh, a final possibility is always engraving from a score or other source if you do not currently have a part. 
Um, and we go from there. So uh, I want to briefly talk about licensing excerpts because uh, for for some people this this uh, this can be uh, kind of kind of new for them. Um, one thing I want to keep in mind for, for anybody who hasn't done it often is that typically this is not something which uh, any kind of fee is usually charged. I mean, and if something is, is charged, it's usually very, very small. So I've, I've had a lot of people within an administration be kind of cavalier and be like, you know, oh, we've never needed to do this in the past. It's the right way to go forward. You know, it's the right way to inform, inform people about what your organization is doing and it fosters a, a better relationship with these people if you're doing things above board. Above board. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, it does not cost anything to do things properly for the most part. Um, so uh, when requesting excerpt licensing, so email or call the local agent for your region um, and include all of the following information, the exact work, including a version if it is pertinent for that work, the composer, uh, the edition if they happen to publish multiple, uh, and the exact start and stop of the excerpt, and then include your organization and the date of the audition. When you're then, requesting a license, oh, excuse me. I think maybe this slide goes with, yeah, um, just making sure you're upfront about how you want to distribute the music to your orchestra, which I see this next slide does have that. Um, you know, many in my experience now will allow you to distribute digitally. Some will require a password, some will require that you do still mail them. And um, in my experience, it's best to follow the guidelines and the permissions that you're granted per each organization. You know, sometimes that means you mail a single excerpt out, but play by the rules is usually the best bet. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, yeah, a tra transparency when communicating with you know anybody outside of your organization is works wonders you know one thing that comes up fairly often is that most of the time an organization may have a copyrighted excerpt you know from a previous audition or they might be basing their excerpt book very closely off or uh, after another organization's audition that may have happened recently that's you know for a very similar position you know it, it is it is it is okay to say that, you know, and certainly if they have a problem with it, then you're at least giving them the, the, the option to exercise the right to say, you know, that's really not okay. You know, please, please destroy that. And in, you know, in the future, we would expect this behavior from you or something like that, you know, get these things out in the open and, you know, kind of, you know, learn, you know, how to, how to play by the rules and how, you know, uh, people, you know, are expecting you, you know, most of the time, when I have communicated with licensing agencies, you know, as long as I'm just very clear about what my plan is, they will typically, you know, go ahead with it because they're going to presume that I'm I'm going to be responsible with, you know, what is their intellectual property. So just be transparent, and if it's a if, if for some reason it's a problem, then at least they they have the right to exercise their rights. So um, if you do not have any kind of copyrighted uh, excerpt which you're going to need for an audition, uh, you can ask them to provide it. Again, just be transparent about your needs. What I will say is that auditions can sometimes happen in a, a real time vacuum, uh, depending on how the committee has uh, decided on excerpts or just how late things happen in the planning stage. So just be aware of your own timelines. Um, excerpts are n not always provided on super tight deadlines. So if time is a particular concern, you could broach the subject of, of perhaps engraving an excerpt yourself if that is something that they would be amenable to. Again, they res it's, it's their copyrighted work. They reserved a right to, to have a say in any kind of plans that you have. But again, it is okay to be transparent about what you might need. So. Not I do see a brief question asking if um, allowing for printing um, with a password protected um, PDF be interchangeable with a physical mail copy. And um, generally speaking, no, the publishers will distinguish between the two. Some of the big guys will allow you to do a password protected PDF. Some will require a physical mail copy. Um, again, be upfront, ask, and I've actually had some publishers send me PDFs to then distribute which has been nice in a jam instead of, you know, faxing, et cetera. Yeah, to, to add to that, I think 
it, it, it certainly, things like this are certainly become more of a possibility in our, in our day and age. Um, if, if you can demonstrate to an organization that you can actually properly secure the document that, you know, is sufficient for their needs, they are going to be more likely to agree to it than just the static, uh, you know, than the static idea of it. I mean, one thing I will say in general is, is that it's, it's a little surprising uh, you know, and this this kind of speaks both to our to our end and their end, but it's it's pretty surprising how easy it is to break through PDF protections, like even password protections, watermarks, things like that. So, you know, I I can kind of even though it sometimes makes life a little hard for us, I can understand the skepticism of some of these larger publishers with you know any kind of movement towards digital distribution. So it's, it's more breakable than it might look sometimes. So um, as, as Mark said, you know, we wanna follow the rules. There are a number of different limitations on using excerpts or being provided excerpts or providing them to applicants that might be put up on you. Anything that you're given by a licensing agent, agent you should follow to the T. Uh, you know, most common is going to be a very exact copyright verbiage, you know, stating the year, any renewal, uh, usually a notice that it's specifically for that organization and that audition so that, you know, things can be tracked back to you if, you know, if for some reason it's being widely disseminated or something. Um, if excerpts are being provided digitally, it'll, they'll usually ask that it be on a part of your website and that, and only on your organization's website and that it will be taken down exactly on the day of the audition. Um, sometimes you will be asked to put it on a copy, uh, excuse me, on a password protected part of your website. Uh, and as we, uh, as we have stated, there are some publishers who will not allow for digital distribution, in which case, again, you would indicate on your excerpt list how the, um, applicants would uh, be receiving th these excerpts. Um, I will say I've, I, we've included this here that password protecting uh, is a possibility. In my experience, I haven't seen that come from the publisher's front, but I have brought it up to publishers before and they have been uh, amenable to that, but it's something that you really have to bring up with them. So we're gonna move on to preparing excerpts. Um, you know, the main thing is really just making sure that everything within the excerpt is clear. We wanna give people, you know, truly equal ground uh, for playing these excerpts, so everything really just comes down to their playing. So the main thing is obviously going to be starts and stops, uh, but also tempo, which can be a, a, a pretty difficult one to, to clarify in excerpt sometimes just because of uh, how many local tempo changes there are. So you, you kind of have to make a decision about how, how to clarify a section. Uh, then, you know, meter, key signature, dynamic, you know, the playing style, whether it's muted or arco, uh, transposition for, for uh, you know, brass instruments, uh, the specific instrument, if it may, if it may be changing uh, or doubling, uh, and then string parts or combined wind parts and French repertoire, certainly what line that is going to be, which you would indicate with an arrow on each line. So some additional considerations as you're preparing each of these excerpts, you know, uh, Include the part that the excerpt is drawn from, especially if it's different from the posted audition position. You know, so if you're holding a bass trombone audition and the parts come from trombone three or trombone four or you know, you know bass trombone and you know in a Puccini opera or something like that, just something that the applicant can trace back where exactly this is and find it in the score would be very useful. Uh, for long excerpts, you may also can consider including some kind of measure count if it's not already included. This can be very useful if in between rounds they want to start at a different place in the excerpt or perhaps end earlier. It can just be much easier to coordinate that information to all the different applicants. You know, again, that's going to be the most nerve-wracking part of everybody's life when they're playing behind that screen. Anything you can do to mitigate, you know, any anything that would play on the nerves during that day would be very useful. Uh, and additionally, as kind of an internal record keeping thing, if, if you've already proofed an excerpt or corrected it, you know, consider including it somewhere on the document for your own purposes. You know, uh, part of that may also be that, you know, if, if you have an excerpt that says it's corrected, it can kind of give your applicants a peace of mind as well. Although it's, it's certainly very common that applicants will 
use the list as a reference and then play off of, you know, whatever music they're comfortable with. But it certainly helps for your internal records to know that you can just pull an excerpt from your collection and know that it's perfectly solid and ready to go. So um, one of the questions that was emailed to us ahead of this uh, presentation was about cropping. This is, you know, it, it's, it's kind of meritorious of, of some discussion. Uh, you know, I think this question came up and we, we kind of felt it, it's kind of a house style decision about how much information you really want to include. You know, at the end of the day, when they play the excerpt, they are only playing that specific part of music. So it's very common to cut out anything that's extraneous and make the start and stop 100% clear, as long as all of the requisite information is included at the beginning, uh, then, you know, it, it, it should not affect uh, anything. Uh, there is something to be said about, you know, the music kind of remaining intact, you know, as it appears on the page and giving a little bit more of the overall context for, for the excerpt. But, you know, you can really make arguments in both directions, as long as whatever music you provide has all of the requisite information needed to start playing at that precise moment. You know, it, uh, it, it you know, I, I, th I think it's the kind of thing that one could debate uh, all day about it. So yeah. the, um, uh, the one thing I really try to consider is the personality of my committee members and my music director. Are they ones to really feel the moment and really want to choose the day of and that sort of personality? I'll, I'll leave more and be brackets just so there's more to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely uh, another logistical concern to consider. You know, as as we as we move into uh, the technological portion of of the meeting, you know, another thing to consider is that the different programs that you're using are going to deal with cropping differently. You know, if you uh, do not have access to something like Photoshop or Gimp at your organization, you know, you can crop an Acrobat, but it's it's only going to be a square. So. You know, you're you're kind of, unless the excerpt just happens to match up perfectly, you're kind of forced to to include a little bit of excess information on either side and indicate with brackets, or you know, add clarifying text to make sure that the applicants have uh, everything that they need. If you're working in Photoshop or GIMP, then you really have a choice of uh, uh, you know of either approach. You know, you can you can crop out everything and move time signatures and meters and key signatures around, um, and you know, and it'll it'll look as exactly as if it was printed that way. Uh, the the main consideration I would say is that if if you want to fully crop out music for the excerpt so that it is truly just the uh, start and stops that they'll be doing, make sure you include as much location information as possible. You know, um, especially with myself and operas, you know, it it is, can be very difficult for an applicant who might be unfamiliar with certain parts of the repertoire to be able to just go into a score and find what music is actually uh, being requested. And since rehearsal marks can be few and far between, if, if, that, if that kind of information is cropped out, it can be you know, nearly impossible. So just keep that in mind if you do choose to go that route. So without further ado, we wanna talk a little bit about uh, different ways that you can prepare these excerpts uh, digitally. Um, and we kind of wanted to start in a different direction. We wanted to start uh, with uh, talking about engraving, uh, only because it's it's probably it's probably the tool in our toolbox that we might pick the least. But we want to just go over the benefits and and when it's a good time to to pull it out. So the the main things to con to consider when you're thinking about this is with the particular excerpt in mind, you know, you know, it, will the music comfortably fit on letter paper? You know, if, if it's going to be shrunk down so small that it's going to be uncomfortable to read, then this is gonna be a problem. You know, the reality is until the, until the applicants come to the audition, you, you really don't have any control over how they're gonna be looking at it, whether it's, you know, whether it's on an iPad or whether they're gonna be printing it out. But if they are printing it out, it's invariably gonna be either letter or A4 if you're uh, outside the United States. So making sure that all of your music fits into that is going to be very important. And for some pieces of music, you know, it's, it's just not really going to be a comfortable size otherwise. Um, another common one is just the music is not 
legible enough. There are definitely some sections of the repertoire which are very much in need of a re-engraving. And if you're able to do it for an excerpt on an audition, the, the, you will be thanked many times over. You know, another important thing is if the excerpt can't fit on two pages, you know, um, you know, having any kind of a page turn in an audition setting is definitely going to make uh, people uncomfortable while they're playing. So if it really can't fit on two open pages, then it, it needs to be, uh, you know, engraved and formatted in a way that it can. Uh, and then really the last reason would just be if, if, the, if the corrections are just so large that it really needs a, a full scale redo, you know, if a, if a transposition for a section has been completely botched or, or something like that, you know, I mean, after that, those, you know, you're always welcome to put excerpts into an engraving program of your choice. You know, there's kind of the same kind of philosophy, house style deliberation you have to make regarding that. You know, m most people for excerpts in general, you know, these excerpts come up all the time. People are going to be very used to specific additions. You know, there is something to be said about providing, you know, an engraved example that is different than what they're used to, you know. Uh, you know, Mark, 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 you may have a different opinion, but, you know, I'm, I'm certainly of the opinion that, you know, at the end of the day, whatever the music director wants and whatever the organization can provide, like, ultimately, that's what, you know, the musicians are going to have on their stand. So, you know, I, you know, to, to me, I, I think as long as, as long as you're doing engraving for a good reason, I, I don't see it as too much of a moral deliberation on my point. What do you, what do you think? I think it really comes back to your culture at your organization. In a symphony orchestra where you're having rapid turnover in programs, the being able to engrave is not always reality. So if your committee members are used to seeing the standard editions, and especially if they have strong opinions about it, and they really want that to be on the stand for the musicians, I tend to go that way. But if you're in an organization where you have a little bit more time, or if someone on your team is really strong, in engraving software, or, you know, I think opera is a perfect case for it since you um, sometimes you're, you know, each production is so heavily edited to the point where it's basically an in-house edition. Mm -hmm. I, I see the case for engraving as well. That's, that's a very good point, especially me being new, new in my position at my organization. Sometimes, you know, uh, I have to open up a box to get an audition excerpt and sometimes the music inside is, uh, you know, I, I have no idea what production it's from. I have no idea what where the edits might come from. So a, a lot of times for opera, it is kind of easier to just go in and do the legwork uh, for that. But you know, it really depends. You know, the other thing is that it really it really comes down to your proficiency in the software of your choice. You know. Yeah, and I will say when I have I occasionally will engrave an excerpt if you know the materials are so beyond repair and I have a quick turnaround and it's just the best way to make a, something usable and it's faster than Photoshop. I've never gotten any pushback that it's not the original engraving. People are just thankful it's legible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm actually. I'm gonna bounce onto my to our next slide real quick because this was a question that came in uh, by email. Um, Somebody asked about the, the concept of a, of a house style when engraving. And I, I think this, this, comes up, this, this comes as a really great question because obviously engraving allows a lot of flexibility in the presentation of material. And the reality is once, once you kind of roll up your sleeves and start to redo it, you, ha you have to make a lot of decisions. So the, the question basically said, you know, how much of the excerpt really should be retained? What kind of things can you change? What kind of things should you match the original presentation? And, you know, I think, I, I think what it comes down to is that, you know, unless, well, audition excerpts is, is not necessarily the best place to put on your editing hat, per se. You know, I, I think, you know, you're already going in and, and redoing it, but the, the reality is unless something is, is, is truly just a glaring error or folly, or something that you have to specifically change, specific to, uh, you know, the committee's desire for this audition. For the most part, everything really should be retained from the original uh, edition or work that you're doing. So, things like, you know, the language of technical or tempi instructions should be maintained. You know, uh, any unusual beaming choices the composer really should be maintained. You know, anything that you can't just, you know, sit down and discount uh, as as an error or something really should be retained as it can, uh, you know, really play a big part in the understanding of, of the music. 
Um, I mean, ultimately, it's just the, the concept of, you know, visual appearance versus true content. And sometimes that can be very problematic in music. So it's not, it's not the best operation to, to set your foot into it unless, you know, there's truly a need for it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to walk us back here real quick. One of the things about engraving software is that's, that's kind of coming around to now, which is exciting, is uh, a new software called Dorico, which came out in 2016. Um, now, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily recommend this for every audition, but this is something that I, I did uh, on my own. But I, I, I saw some capabilities with this, with, uh, with flows, which are, are truly uh, separated movements within a file, which is something kind of unique to Dorico. And when I was making a, uh, an audition booklet, I had to engrave uh, quite a number of the excerpts. And I said, what if I could just do all of them here? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you um, a nice little booklet that I've done. Now, this this goes back to to what um, to what oh I see this goes back to what Philip was saying at the top of the meeting. Can everybody see this uh, Houston Grand Opera audition excerpt booklet here? All right, I'm seeing seeing a couple nods and thumbs up, which is good. So uh, this is a bass trombone uh, audition booklet. Um, this audition was unfortunately canceled due to, to the current situation. But um, believe it or not, every single thing in this document was done in Dorico. This entire list, this graphic, the header, and everything. Um, and every excerpt is based on a master page template, which you can do in Dorico. So you just drop in the the music and everything is formatted all on its own. You know, I, again, the header information could go a million different ways. I, I choose to format it like this and include the instrument that it comes from that, you know, for my internal records that I've proofed it. Um, and again, I've chosen to provide only the exact material which they're going to play. Um, and so pretty much you can drop this on the stand of, of any person who could play an instrument. They, they should uh, have everything that they need to, to perform this very, very well. Um, and I was able also to coordinate with the committee ahead of time on what some possible like specific metronome marks for the excerpts that they would be looking for. So, um, so now what I want to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up this exact file in Dorico real quick. And um, I um, just need one moment for it to load. So, so what we have here is the exact same PDF which I, I showed you before. Um, so if you're not familiar with, with Dorico, um, uh, so some of the concepts which allow something like this to be possible are flows, um, which are, are truly separate parts of music, which are here. So in this case, each flow or movement is its own excerpt. Um, because they're truly separate, um, I can go to system information and I can set all of this metadata for every single excerpt. So in this case, for the subtitle, I'm, I'm using this as location information. Uh, for, the compo for the dedication, I'm using uh, alphabetical by last name, which goes into my excerpt list. Uh, uh, composer, I'm using as composer. Arranger, I'm using as the instrument. And lyricist, uh, I'm using as kind of my proofing information. And then for those uh, excerpts which are copyrighted, I'm including the, the licensing information that the licensing agent gave me, which I'm including here. So all of these go into kind of like a wild card or a token, but um, it's just a, it's a call name uh, where if any information in these fields are updated, it will automatically populate in, into each of the excerpts. So what's really cool about this, and I'll show you here, the most complicated part of this is the, the, is the, the very first page where this is a master page where I've included all of these text frames and all of these are tokens. So the date that it was saved, the page count, uh, you know, what the audition is for is what I'm doing as the title. Um, 
solo selections, and then all of these are wildcards. So if I move any of these around, or if I change the excerpt completely, it will just automatically update. So this is going to throw me back, but I'm just going to start. I'm going to start moving things around, and I've moved. Um, I'm going to move William Tell all the way into Britain's territory. And we're going to see that William Tell now is right before Peter Grimes. You know, Haydn, I've, I've now moved in, in a completely ridiculous order. But all of this will automatically update. So I spent a lot of time making this template. If you're anybody who is interested in Dorico, you know, this is, you know, kind of just showing, showcasing some of its core abilities. It's, it's kind of cool. Again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for every audition that comes across your board, but depending on the excerpts in question, you might consider it. Um, so I've already made this template. It, you know, it kind of has this HGO look to it, but uh, I'm happy to provide it. You know, at the very least, it makes dealing with the text frames a lot easier. So, but more more than likely, um, if you're if you're dealing with uh, engraved excerpts, you're only going to be doing one or two at a time. So. Uh, So Philip, you know, obviously in programs like, you know, Finale and Sibelius, you know, you don't, you don't have things like, like flows. So, you know, you can't really put all of your excerpts together as distinct things. Uh, but certainly the, the, all of the other engraving programs are, are very robust and great for, for re-engraving things. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how metadata might be useful in creating uh, an excerpt template in, you know, Finale or Sibelius or another program of your choice? Sure, Joshua. I think that was an excellent overview, and it really goes to show the power of setting up templates uh, correctly and uh, not having to repeat yourself. And I want to um, maybe just uh, illustrate that uh, a little bit uh, on uh, a couple of examples. And uh, you'll have to bear with me again because we have a little bit of an issue where I'm unable to share the like the, the desktop writ large. So I've got to choose uh, particular files to uh, to share, um, which uh, kind of cramps uh, our style a little bit here. But we'll do the best we can. Um, so I'm sharing this uh, particular uh, excerpt. Uh, this is something called uh, Only Yesterday, and uh, please avert your eyes uh, if there are any copyright issues here. I know we talked about that in the first uh, part of the uh, uh, lecture today. So um, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is there are a lot of, there's a lot of information that uh, can be used in whether it's the prefatory material, uh, whether it's the titles, what, whether it's the running headers. And all these things behind the scenes, uh, you, all, you all can see this only yesterday, yes? Uh, okay. So if I click, if I actually double click on this, I'm in Sibelius. And uh, these are all wildcards. They function broadly similar to the way um, Josh uh, described them in, um, in Dorico. And what they do is they will call um, a, uh, something behind the scenes in the file tab. And you'll see here, I've, I've tricked out the, the score info where it says only yesterday for the title. It says who the composer is. It says who the artist is. And in some cases, there might be even more information. But what that will do is that um, on my title page, you know, uh, there's the title wildcard. There's the composer. Um, and then same thing with the running headers. If I move over here, uh, I'll sh it'll, that's the same thing. So uh, this is just a very basic thing. And if you have a template and you're setting up, whether it's audition materials or many excerpts, what have you, uh, you what you can do is you can change this to, uh, you know, you only have to change it once. And every instance of that wild card then updates. It updates here. It updates, um, you know, on the title page. It updates uh, here on the running header. So that's uh, something that's very useful, I find, um, in, in Sibelius. There are a number of plugins that also uh, make it easier. Uh, again, this is not necessarily the place to go in depth into plugins, but if you are uh, into that, um, if you know about Sibelius plugins and you want to look a little more, um, there are a number of, of various plugins that I can recommend, and you can find them in when you install them through the program. 
and they all have to do with score info. Um, how do I share? How do I switch um, the application that I'm sharing, Joshua? Uh, is that um, yeah, what you can do is at the top of your screen, screen, you should be able to click New Share, uh -huh. uh, and then you can select the next window that you need to move to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, if I um, okay, so now I'm sharing my uh, browser, but one of them is called Distribute Score Info. It basically takes uh, the info from these fields and distribute it uh, distributes it to um, the score info field. In other words, like for whatever reason, when when you start a new document in Sibelius, um, and I'll go back to Sibelius here. And um, if you start a new uh, document, um, can you see this new quick start? Uh, mm, no? I'm afraid not. Right. Okay, so you know we'll scrap this. It's unfortunately we haven't figured out this this new uh, Zoom thing. Anyway, tr take my word for it. That's basically the the gist of what I wanted to get. And and you know there's there's more info uh, on on how to do that. Um, so Finale, those of you that use Finale, it's a very similar thing. Um, and the metadata is contained. Let me uh, share uh, my Finale uh, window. And uh, this is contained in the score uh, info uh, area. And again, behind the scenes, these are wild cards. So you see HCT Movie Medley, Opening Night Gala. Behind the scenes, these are living in uh, the finale, um, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, in, it's the uh, um, I'm, I'm losing my uh, I'm having a, a score manager is what it's called. <laughs> Sorry, can you see the score manager? Yes, no. I can. Okay. I can. Yes. Uh, okay. Good. So basically, it's similar. It's broadly similar. It's a little tab called File Info. And again, if I were to change this to something else you'll see that um, it has automatically changed everywhere I've had that. So that's a very important way of setting up templates um, so that they will respect the, the, you know, these tokens, these wild cards. And that can really speed up your work and it, and it gives a consistent look. And you don't, and, it, and it, the main thing is that when you update a document, um, you don't have to worry about that you've updated the same information in five different places. You do it once, and then you propagate it to whatever. And it can be a different text style. It can be a different position on the page. Um, and if you want to put that in somewhere for, for whatever reason in, in Finale, if I wanted to create a new text item here, let's say, and uh, I would use the text uh, insert, and I would, this is where you insert all that stuff. And, uh, and you know, I would just insert the title, and then I can set the properties however I like. Going back, um, I want to also mention something. So that's that's the basic uh, summary of that. I want to actually mention two things going back to what you mentioned, um, uh, Joshua, a, a little bit earlier, especially if you're dealing with PDFs. And this is whether or not you're using engraving software, actually, the first one. And it's, a, it's actually a pretty um, uh, little uh, fix, but everybody has Acrobat um, pretty much. And, you know, you talked about the importance of making sure everything can fit on two pages. And if it doesn't, you know, how do you make sure that, that it will? So let me open up this file. Um, uh, or, or, you know, how can you, how can you at least preview what it's going to look like on the page? A very quick way of doing it. Let me open up this uh, file. And um, I'm going to have to change to uh, Acrobat here. So again, please bear with. Okay, so I'm showing you Acrobat. So the default view, at least when I'm using Acrobat, is the single page view, which isn't particularly helpful in showing the page layout of a file. But it, there is a setting here, um, and it's in the view area. And if you see page display, you see two page view. Okay, so then you may be thinking, aha, the page layout is not correct because page one is, uh, a, you know, really a right page, right facing page, uh, typically, and page two is a left facing page. So the way to get around that is you go to view and you say page display and then you say show cover page in two page view. And this way you can scroll through. I have only have a three page document here, but you can see now 
I will be able to see very quickly those page spreads in Acrobat and see where those page turns are. Um, it's very helpful. Um, I'll see if I can quickly uh, pull up a, um, yeah, I can pull up a, uh, a long file and you can, you'll be able to see how, uh, how useful that is in um, basically reviewing a, um, uh, um, a, a part and, and going through and seeing where all the good page turns are. So let me open up um, another file here and this is a long part. So this is a, what is this, a 53 page part, if you can see that. And this way I can scan very quickly, like, okay, you know, there's page one. And again, you have to enable the setting again. So view, uh, page display, two page view, and um, uh, show cover page and two page view. And now I can go and I can just very quickly and scroll through, you know, my, my eye goes to the bottom right hand corner of each of those uh, odd pages and see, ah, do I have good page turns? You know, has something been messed up? That was, you know, obviously, a, you know, a compromise situation where you have the, you know, the string players are going to uh, uh, have to turn the page at the, bit, the end of page 13. But, you know, by and large, you know, you set this up as best you can. That's a, obviously a scene break, so that was okay. Um, and you can just see, you know, very quickly how that works. So that's a good, you know, view option if you're wanting to see how that's going to print out. The other thing I wanted to mention, you mentioned um, preparing, like, do you engrave something? Do you try to match a house style? Do you try to match the manuscript or the source material? And uh, something I found that is useful to, you know, it's like, how, well, how do I get the, the staff size just right? Do I print out the page and then take a ruler and then all this? And there's a much easier way. If you have a PDF already and you know you want to then use those settings in your finale or Sibelius document, uh, you can go and you can do this on any PDF and you go to the, um, there's something called the measure tool. I don't know if anyone has ever used this thing in Acrobat. I think it's even in the free version in Acrobat Reader. Um, somebody That's might, right. Yeah, but there's a measuring tool and you can just double click and I'm going to zoom in for effect here, but say, okay, I want to see what the staff, what the size of the staff is. And I'm just going to double click and you can even, you know, have it snap to, if it's a vector, uh, PDF, it'll actually, you know, snap to those lines. If it's an image, if it's a scanned PDF, obviously it won't do that. But you can just um, measure, and you can just see really quickly. Ah, okay, this is the. Um, whoops. Uh, this is the uh, the size of the staff, and <laughs> obviously with these screen sharing things, things sometimes go awry. But there you go. So I can see what the you know the size of the staff is. And uh, the settings, if I want to change this to millimeters, which we often use, you know, a seven millimeter staff or a seven and a half uh, millimeter staff, you can change that in the preferences. And you can just double click and, um, uh, and, and do that. Apologies for the technical glitches there. But uh, that's basically the, you know, how that works. And then what you can do is you can go back to your Sibelius and you know it doesn't it's not just for staff but you can you know decide okay what is the uh, you know the size of the margin and you know measure that and get this you know you can kind of take readings of all of the you know the elements of your PDF and then you know you get that information take it and go back to your Sibelius document or finale what have you and um, I will go to Sibelius and uh, let me actually go to a part file. Um, and can you see this? We've only just begun this part. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is in your document setup, of course. And you can say, oh, okay, I know it's a seven and a half millimeter staff or whatever it is. And I can make that change. And you can set up your, you know, you basically can set up your Sibelius document to match what you find. And there's some pretty cool tricks. You know, I know we're going kind of fast here, but I did actually write a whole little article. Those of you that follow the, my blog scoring notes, um, I will include a link uh, to that uh, in the chat. It's uh, there's a um, the, but there's a blog post where I actually go through and it you know show you how to do it. You can also do it in preview if you're Mac based. It's not as quite as sophisticated as. Uh, as um, Acrobat, but it does do the trick in a pinch. With with Adobe, if you really nerd it out on this, you could act, you can actually export all this data into a spreadsheet and like keep this information on hand. 
So that's, um, you know, that, that, that can help you streamline the process of if you have to basically use, say you have a two page excerpt, but you only want to engrave, like the, you only need to engrave the last line um, of it and you want to use the source material for the rest of it, this can help you get a head start on matching the size and, uh, um, you know, style. Uh, of of all that so there's there's a in the chat there's a link to that um, uh, article there's also I'm going to put a link actually the two page spread thing there's a similar trick in in the Mac preview as well um, so that's a trick on on how to view those so those are um, you know it's funny I didn't realize that until you mentioned it Joshua but those are probably mm -hmm. a couple of good things to know about oh yeah no those are wonderful thanks so much for that mm -hmm. uh, you know kind of a an 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 important note that I would say about all of that. Uh, you know, me metadata and, and these, uh, these kind of form fields that you can populate with information, you know, there's a limited amount of them in any of the programs. So certainly, you know, if you have a composer field and a ranger field, something like that, if you're not going to use that, you know, be flexible with it, uh, you know, abuse it, put all, any kind of information that you want into it, you know, um, a general, a general theme of, you know, software for music librarians in general is that it's pretty rare that we're using every aspect of our software exactly as it was intended to be used. So, you know, that's right. feel free yeah. to use it flexibly. I often, you know, often I don't have a use for some of these fields and I will freely uh, reappropriate them, uh, repurpose mm -hmm. them for, for other purposes. Yeah. All right. Um, Philip, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal control from you, Great. but, um, we're gonna, we're gonna go on to, uh, an, an important, uh, aspect, which is when preparing digital excerpts, you know, what are some options that are available to you if your organization doesn't have a subscription to Photoshop or doesn't have, you know, an old version from when it was a, a retail. So the there, there are, there are ways, you know, um, you know, Mark and I looked into it a lot and he found a, a really great method that I, I think is, is very beautiful. And you would, you know, you would never know that it hadn't been, you know, diligently attended to in, in Photoshop or something like that. But, um, you know, the main things to consider is that if you're not going to use some kind of image manipulation, like Photoshop or GIMP, what you scan is what you get. So everything already has to be there. So if you need to darken note heads, if you need to darken lines, you know, if you need to pen in the tempo information, you know, right above, uh, you know, the start of it or write in key signatures, other corrections, you know, that has to be done ahead of time, you know, um, you know, and then after that, as you know, scan as straight as possible and with as high DPI as possible, you know, uh, 600 is great, 300 is fine if the, if the original print quality is very good in and of itself. So, um, you know, after that, you know, you can, you can produce it entirely uh, in Acrobat. You know, it's, again, we're not using software that's built for our needs per se, but, you know, they're robust enough that we can abuse them into uh, making them work for us. So, uh, Mark, do you want to take it from here with what you've found and, and, and just show them how good it looks? Yeah. Um, for some context um, in the process, Preparing for this session, it came to our attention. Some people are wondering just how much you could do in Acrobat specifically with preparing audition excerpt packets. Um, and like Joshua said, just like in Photoshop, it can do a lot if you know where to look. Um, so I'm going to jump right in and steal the screen. Uh, let me see. Here we go. And that's my. Can everyone see right now? There should be some Photoshop. There should be my desktop. Does it look good, Josh? Um, right now, we're looking at a Chrome window. Okay. Or it's some, some kind of internet. Let me stop share and let me get, let me try that again. Yeah. We, Joshua, you and I did this yesterday and it didn't have the same limitation. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure what that is, but um, yeah, you have to choose the exact uh, specific screen for some reason. Are we are we looking at Acrobat now on your screen as well? On mine. Great. So I found a way, um, especially I think a, a big thread here is trying to have a template in whatever format you're doing. If it's, you know, engraving throughout, if it's a Word document, which Josh will demonstrate after this, if it's in Acrobat, 
having your own in-house style guide, um, whether that is notation specific or if that's also your text for instructions, your, your margins, your, where your logo is, is your branding and is your text matching your organization style guide, especially if they just spent a good amount of money rebranding as so many of us have been doing. So you really want to take that into consideration from the start to the finish of whatever method you're going, since at the end of the day, it is an outward communication from the organization going to people who aren't on the stand, you know, playing for you yet. Um, so what I figured out in this right here is, you know, it's very unassuming looking, but I made more or less a template using the forms field and using the um, watermark tool, but instead of using it, you know, to mark confidential, et cetera, placing my logo, since you're not allowed in Acrobat to put a logo in a header or a footer, I, in a roundabout way, created that. Also did my, you know, position information, date, so in future years, I can remember exactly why and when this excerpt came about. And then for me, I put these text fields up here at the top, so I can just do uh, a some point on this one. Double base, jumps down, browse. I'm gonna cap, I'm gonna do all caps for you. And then you can modify this, and I'll show you how in a second, to whatever your house style is. And you can include, you know, if you would like to crop and not use Photoshop, you can include tempo markings. Oh, caps lock. You can do. Tempo indications, you can in text form, time signature, et cetera. So that way, if it's cropped out, the information is still there. Um, and for Ein Helmet, I normally put movement information here. No such luck in a tone poem. And then I would just right click, add image, go in, got my Strauss sample. And then actually, I'm going to cancel that and delete you. If you do control R, get a ruler, which is very helpful. And then you add your image. I have it already cropped down. You can do that in paint if you want to remove the margin so it's already cropped down to size. You can scan it in, you know, analog. I'm a big fan in this method since the image manipulation is the biggest limitation of Acrobat. If you don't have Photoshop or access, if you're not, you know, ready yet to jump into GIMP, and if what you have at your disposal is paint, it's a little bit limited to say the least. So if you want to do it completely analog and you know that looks often just as beautiful if not more beautiful, this is a very viable option. So do all the work by hand. I have it cropped, you can do it in paint. And the reason why I redid it is now I have these guidelines that you see up at the top on the ruler on either side. And I can place at a specific spot, so I'm always starting my excerpt in the exact same location, which is great for a style guide for consistent consistency between. Drop it in, and then just down here, you get these nice green guidelines again. And I can set to my margin that I prefer. There you go. Um, it's fairly straightforward. And the big part of the process that you have, you're probably thinking right now, well, I don't really want to send out something to my applicants where I have these text boxes that are interactive. And um, there's also a problem where if you copy in the same template over and over again, those will autofill to the same exact information over and over and over again. So unless you want to have all Strauss, it might not work for you. So the way I found out through a little bit of, you know, going down the rabbit hole, if you go into, oh, let me see, protect, which you can search, which is a really great feature. Go into protect, and then do not do optimizing or sanitizing, which I've toyed with in the past. That can really granulate everything, make your image quality really, really, you know, you spend all this time and effort making it look beautiful by hand. You don't want that to ruin it. Instead, go to remove hidden information. And then you get this drop-down box here that lets you choose what you want to remove. And you can just select to remove the form field information. Click remove. And there you go. Now you just have the text from your text fields. And you can then add more pages. And you can repeat 
as needed and build your method that way. But the big benefit is your text is preset in size, it's preset in font, it's preset in position. Um, let me close that out and let me go back over to the template. I also highly recommend having a backup copy. It's very easy to accidentally save your template as a new excerpt. And let me show you a little bit of how to do that. I'll skip the watermark. You can pretty easily Google that, figure that one out. But let me go into the forms and show some of those things. I had never used it before, um, like any depth before a few weeks ago. So now I have my information up here at the top. There's a bunch of different tools. This is designed more for, you know, like tax forms and HR needs and compiling data about personal information, which all these fields can be, like Philip was mentioning in other capacities, turned into an Excel document uh, with these if you need it in that way. Not really necessary for excerpts, we already have our list. Um, and then we have, tech, we have text, so you can do this right here. We have the text field, which is what I primarily use. You can also add an image um, and then just drag and drop in an image or add, uh, add it that way, but it automatically has some settings where it doesn't position it towards the top, so I don't tend to use it. And let me just add a new one, just for case in point. I'm a text box, go here. I can, no, there we go. I'll just do, say, example for the name, which would be, say, music, composer, et cetera. And then you get into your properties, which is important for us. You can kind of dig through these if you have it. Um, I like to keep the form field visible. Visible but doesn't print actually makes the text disappear as well. So I recommend keeping it visible. Appearance is really useful. Um, make sure that your border color and your fill color are set to no color. This is where you can control your font size. So you can have this box always show up with the same fonts. I, my house style, because I work uh, at so many different places that don't necessarily have um, style guides all the time, has always been Garamond. I do that, text color. You can manually control the position, um, which is really helpful. And you also have some additional options right here, alignment, right, center, left, like we're used to. Um, and I haven't really used the other four too much. There may be things in there that I've yet to discover that are valuable for our needs. Um, and then the exciting thing, you can control C, control B. The same thing. And then that way all those settings you just did, the properties, automatically are transferred over to the new ones. So that's exciting. And then over here, if you see my cursor, there's some different shorthands for page layout that are pretty useful. So right here we have alignment. These are all kind of horizontal, vertical. Centering, which I don't use too much, but it's useful. You can also match the size, both height and width, and you can distribute. I'll try to show you one of each. So let me get all those guys. I'll go to alignment. Now they're all automatically aligned to the left. And let's say match size. I'm gonna make this one look cartoonishly large. We're going to now have everything be the same size. And now we're going to make this one a little bit smaller. Everything's now back the same size, same with width. And then distribute takes the top and the bottom and automatically will space them out evenly, which is really useful. So that way it takes away the necessity to manually do it and guess. It just does it automatically mathematically for you. Um, those are the biggest things I noticed in that front. And when it comes to putting the book together, Philip showed us a lot of what I was gonna show you, the measuring tool is really valuable there at the end to check your margins, check your spacing. If you have multiple excerpts per page, I, that way you can make sure your text is the same but from your excerpt for both examples really clearly. And the last thing I like to do, since my organizations have always wanted me to send to applicants every excerpt, and we do it digitally, um, usually behind the password. So I'm always creating a booklet for them. If I go, and then, am I still on Acrobat, Joshua? You are. Yeah. Okay.
let me stop my screen sharing and let me try that again. Here we go. A little share. And if you have only had Rear, I'm not sure if it does this. And if you haven't quite yet jumped over to Acrobat at your organization, the easy, it makes you know managing pages like Philip was saying a breeze. You can take your letterhead, your excerpts. I have a few. I like to save them in a format where they're in order, so it automatically is going to be combining them in the correct order. Hit enter or actually right click, combine an Acrobat, beautiful thing. It will automatically at this point combine a Word document into a PDF. You don't have to do it first. And am I now, let me see, stop share. Let me start. I should be back in Acrobat now. Feel free to let me know if I'm not. And now you have the page organization or before you actually have it combined, you can zoom in. Uh, actually, it's not gonna work, I think, in my screen share mode, but you can zoom in and out, so you can really easily, with you know, just control, plus and minus, getting in close to see what's in the pages. You can drag and drop order, whatever you need. Once you're ready, you can also um, add in blank page turns here if you need them, if you have a template saved somewhere, it's really easy for pagination. Combine everything. And, you know, give it a second. And it will combine them for you. So this is my a Word document. Um, I'll, let, I'll save that for Joshua to show his template for how he builds his there. And, you know, using what Philip showed us, go to page display, two page scrolling. I have it set to show that cover page and you can just go through, control zero, getting me back. And then they're more or less lined up right away. I've got the same header and footer every time, but my favorite part is the text at the top is set to look exactly the same per page. Oh, I see one snuck by me. So all I would do is um, change that, get rid of that guy. It'll make me save it as a booklet. I'll just let it save as binder. Boom, that's gone. You can send that out to applicants without having the weird text field. Uh, I would also recommend before sending it out to applicants, printing, doing a red line pass through to make sure nothing has been missed, doing another edit round, um, and then locking it at the end. And um, Philip, let me know I, if you have any experience with this. I just did my first action in Acrobat for working on this project. So you can, in the action wizard, you can go through and create your own customized info. And I just have a little button up here now at the top that I added to my custom toolkit that does, you know, instead of having the three steps of drilling in of going to protect, going to select hidden data and going to, you know, unchecking. So only that text is going away. It now only is having, um, it only, I can do it in one click. So it's kind of like Photoshop, you know? Yeah, I mean, you can, there are uh, different, um, uh, you know, uh, actions that you can create or uh, you can, uh, you can use those. Uh, a, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually, <laughs> I'll, I'll bypass Acrobat um, and uh, uh, I'll actually use some of the tools that I ended up, um, you know, building um, for these types of things, which are, you know, they're freely available um, and sometimes they they will actually do the work of removing those form fields. Uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly how um, uh, it does it, but um, it 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 may be a, a better way to do it. Um, yeah, it's it's that's another way. Uh, the 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 tools that I'm talking about. Um, let me get them up here. Actually, if. Uh, if you, if anyone is interested, I've I've shared these before at MOLA conferences. Uh, whoops, I shared it with uh, Katie, but uh, I meant to share it with everybody. Uh, so what this is is um, uh, I'll just go to the website since it's a little easier to uh, to mm -hmm. show. These are various uh, tools, and they do kind of what you were talking about, Mark, but 
each one has a specific purpose and then there's there are there's one that's kind of a one size fits all but mm -hmm. there's a very free there's a very simple free utility um that is called pdf batch stitch and what that does you basically just drag the items in and you can uh set the what's nice about this which you don't have an acrobat is you can actually set the number of copies uh in the right hand window there and there is even an option for uh yeah so you can like say if you were putting together if you were run, doing a print run and you were going to do like string run of 98765 it will create a pdf of that many copies of each file and you just drag them in there's also a little option if you were printing this double sided and you wanted to make sure that if you were saying you had a pdf that was uh, a two page document and a three page document and a five page and a four page it will there's an option to always say add a blank page at the end of any file with an odd number of pages so that each file starts on a right hand page and it's just a very simple tool it's called pdf batch stitch but um it uh, is really you know i find it very useful in preparing these sorts of documents uh if you're doing this on a regular basis um another one is uh, well pdf batch scale is basically scaling up or down uh the size of the document if you're going from a 9 by 12 to a letter or whatever that's very uh it's very easy and you quick you can choose a whole bunch of options there um and uh pdf batch booklet this basically booklets uh, uh files and uh, you can do it in a straight page order you can do it in a folded booklet uh, order so that's a good way i mean these are just tools i use i use all the time every day and i never found like acrobat is so vast and there's so many settings and i just i just i just wanted something to drag and drop something into and get the result i needed and spit it out to the printer and um and so i ended up you know there wasn't anything quite like it and then pdf music binder is really designed for um for music librarians and music preparers where it, what we will do it'll take a series of pdfs and it will do all these things and will create one booklet file uh and um it will you know if you're if you're creating like say you're creating a whole a whole booklet of excerpts and you wanted to put drag them all into and you wanted to resize you know they were they were all different sizes and you want to make them all nine by you want to create like an 18 by 12 or a 19 by 13 uh you know booklet that was then folded over and printed on nine and a half by 13 paper or what have you and just drop it all in there you could drop it all in in, in one step and basically create uh you know the binder essentially and um and that's the way that works and it you know you can and like i said it has the same functionality where you can set the number of copies and you can drag and reorder the uh the order of everything and you can you know spit out there's a whole bunch of other cool stuff but um those if you're doing this sort of thing and it's on a timetable and you really want to customize how these things are going to appear um you know i in my world which i know is a little bit different than maybe the you know the day-to-day -day librarian tasks but broadly speaking music prep i mean i uh I, I'm the purveyor of these tools, but as you can see, you know, you don't have to pay any money for it. If, if uh, you, you're not inclined, uh, you can use them and I, and I use them all the time. So that's another, those are some other options. And then um, jumping back a step, I think there was a question, Joshua, I saw you were answering that mm -hmm. it was good to make you repeat for everyone. Um, asking that, is there any drawback to using InDesign? Um, actually, I would say InDesign is kind of perfect, custom made for doing an audition packet. It's just, it's so powerful. It's kind of the same drawback some people have with a mind to start Photoshop. It's so highly specific for doing, you know, newspapers and magazines and that, that kind of power. That it kind of eclipses what we need and it, we would only need it so rarely that I have yet to actually sit down and learn it. But I would actually say if you want to make beautiful publishable, uh, publishable level, you know, excerpt packets, especially if you're like in that academic institution where you may use the same ones for years and years and years and years, it might be a good route to go. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, oh, one moment. It's definitely designed uh, for this kind of 
this kind of work. You know, the, the hard thing with some of these uh, Adobe products is just that, you know, they're so expensive, you know, it, you pretty much either have to buy into one of their plans or, yeah. or every single one. And it's, it's hard to justify the cost to our IT department sometimes. Exactly. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I would say the, the main thing that's useful with InDesign is, is the in inclusion of image frames. Um, so as you saw with, with Mark demonstrating in Acrobat, you know, you can use form, form fields to create text frames, which stay in a static place. But uh, for InDesign, you would also be able to do that with images. You know, um, there is technically that capability in Acrobat, but it, some, it, it sometimes interferes with the quality of your image. So it's, it's best to be avoided in many places, as, uh, as Mark said. Um, so one of the ways that I've done audition booklets in the past has been with Word. Um, which is a, if you set up your template right, is a little bit easier about having consistent image placement. Um, you know, Word is obviously kind of more familiar to us in our in our day to day work for the most part. Um, it's it's pretty readily available, so it's it's a, a useful vehicle for this kind of stuff as well. Um, you know, it's it's very easy to globally change text or margin formatting. You know, one of the downsides of it versus Acrobat, as you saw with uh, with Mark's part is that, you know, you can freely reorder any of the pages as need be, you know, Word is very much, I mean, it's a word processor, it's not a publication or publishing tool. So it pretty much just expects you to just be filling in for information from the top down. So if you suddenly needed to reorganize things, you're going to have to do some very diligent copying and pasting to make sure things uh, are still looking uh, the way that they should. Uh, however, once you do that, uh, and I'm going to switch on over here, you know, uh, can everyone see this HDO audition booklet? Yes. All right. So uh, you'll see. So this is this is actually our our standard uh, booklet, and this is what I actually based the Dorica one on. And I, I'd like to think I got pretty close, um, but this is this is my Word document, um, and I think it looks pretty good. I what I have is I have a template for the entire booklet all in one Word file. You know, very similar to the approach that you can do with Acrobat is you can just have a template for just one excerpt at a time. And then, you know, you can store it on your organization's network server and, you know, you can just pull excerpts for it for different auditions that might happen. Um, in my case, I, you know, I decided to give it a go in one uh, audition packet. So the, you know, really the main, you know, the only main thing is that, you know, everything that's within here you know, you can get pretty technical with um, bookmarks and chapter headings and things like that in Word. Uh, overall, Word does not do a splendid job of automatically updating them. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that approach unless you're very diligent about making it a part of your process. But everything I have here is just entered in manually except for um, header information. This is, uh, this is uh, essentially a wildcard in Word. Uh, the same thing for page number is a wildcard in Word. Everything else is uh, just entered in top. But, um, you know, I, th I think we're all fairly uh, comfortable making the audition list in Word. Um, and then basically for the template, this is a, this is a table, uh, which can be copy and pasted from one page to another fairly easily. Um, and, you know, once you have that table in place, once you paste an image into the document, it's always going to go right beneath that table. So it's a little bit easier having a consistent image placement or excerpt placement in the packet. Um, but, you know, as I said, it's, it's until you turn it into a PDF, it's much harder to be able to flexibly rearrange pages. But you can get a, a pretty consistent uh, excerpt packet design. You know, mine's a little bit bare bones, um, you know, I think the I indulged myself and I put our, our little uh, rosette logo here as uh, as part of the page number thing. Um, but um, I, I want to very briefly go into what's actually behind the scenes in that template. Uh, and this is again, this is the template that, you know, after this presentation, I'm, ha I'm happy to provide or talk about uh, a bit more about how you might uh, make your own. But you know what my template really is, uh, and we should be uh, back to Word now here. Um, you know, I've edited this to make this kind of generic. I've, I've take, you know, it's still in the kind of layout that I use, but I've taken out the, the HDO things. But essentially speaking, um, 
I'm going to go, I have this little button for showing tables. Everything in here is a table. So rather than having to select and position or change these fonts as I need for different things, you know, my audition packet, you know, will always be here. You know, the, depending on how many uh, excerpts there actually are, you know, I can just fill them into this table. You know, we always have possible sight reading, but if I have an excerpt with, you know, uh, if I have a packet with a bunch of different excerpts, you know, I can, uh, Oh, well, I should do this correctly, but I can just add in the rows here and it'll just automatically push that down. And so it allows me to really keep a pretty consistent formatting here. You know, the, the really the only main thing, which is a little bit different, if I double click up here, you know, you can see once we head into headers, I have, I need to have a different first page header, you know, cause this is going to show me when this is issued and how many pages are included. Um, not, and for, you don't have to do this depending on where you choose to have the, the page number located, but I like to have the page number on the outside edges, you know, just similar to an ordinary uh, music publication. But um, uh, I do different odd and even page headers so that, you know, my, uh, my verso pages are on the left side and my recto page numbers are on the right side. You know, after that really the, the template for the excerpt it's just going to be this little table. And you can, again, you can format this however you feel is best. You know, I choose to have title, um, you know, the location, which for opera is direly necessary. Um, uh, the instrument, because, you know, again, we, we, we tend to pull excerpt materials from all over, including occasionally from symphonic work. So it, it's, it just helps people uh, do score, score study on the back end. Um, composer, I use like a little correction day for kind of internal use. You know, if the audition committee has any specific information that they want to put here, you know, uh, I've had people, you know, point out certain errata in an addition that, you know, it's been corrected there, but, you know, the committee had just said, you know, put a note at the top so that everybody sees like, you know, in this measure, note that this is like a major, major flagrant mistake that everybody plays, you know. So any additional information could be there and you can really add whatever you want. But, um, you know, I'm not, just for time purposes, I'm not gonna demonstrate today, but you know, once you're beneath the header, you know, you can copy and paste in any kind of image the same way that Mark showed and it will be placed exactly there. Because of words use of margins, it will automatically uh, center that within those margins and won't extend beyond them unless you really start to abuse it. So as long as the size of the image is reasonable to put on eight and a half by 11 or A4 paper, it will automatically do that, you know, and you can always uh, either uh, export to PDF or print to paper to make sure that you're comfortable with the size that it is. You know, after that, um, if I choose, uh, if I turn on formatting, which is a control shift, uh, eight or the, the little star in your keyboard uh, for, for Windows, you know, you can see that every excerpt is going to end with a page break so that it, uh, everyone always starts on a new page, you know, and then you can just build the excerpt from there. You know, if you have a very static list, you know, you already know what the excerpts uh, are going to go in order and you know that there's not going to be too many changes, you can go ahead and build the entire list this way and just start filling in excerpts. Uh, and then you can just file, uh, save as, as Adobe PDF and and you're you're good to go. Um, if you're if the list is a little bit less static, or especially if it's something like a percussion audition, where you know they may decide to do, you know, the mallet instruments in a different order, just depending on you know what excerpts they want to hear or something like that. If you have any idea of what the order is going to be for something like that, you might do the excerpts as individual word documents, which again would really just be you know, this page here on the right, just this little table, and then you can always compile them into PDF after and rearrange as need be, you know, that might be a better approach to go. But, um, you know, there's, you know, I, you know, any, anybody's happy to, to email me a little bit more about this. That's really only the, the core concepts one needs to know about just dropping images into, into Word, you know, same thing. Once you go the word route, you you really it's better suited to have some kind of access to Photoshop or GIMP only because there's there's not a super great way to like overlay, you know, a bracket uh, to show where the start and stops are in Word. You know, you could either uh, do it by hand and then scan the image in, or you know, ideally you're using uh, Photoshop or GIMP to just crop out anything that's unnecessary, just so that it's very clear. Um, that's one thing I didn't demo, but in um, Acrobat, you can, on top of your image, do a text and just do a oversized bracket in whatever font you 
think looks the best and just manually move it that way. So that's mm -hmm. the benefit. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm going to head back to here. You know, that's really the main things that we've kind of uh, explored with all of this, you know, uh, in, in many ways, you know, we, we want to, you know, we mostly wanted to focus on programs that we kind of already have. Um, you know, as, as we said, you know, in, in design is an amazing program, you know, Photoshop is an amazing program. And, you know, it's our hope that, you know, eventually it will not be so hard to convince our organizations to provide it for us because it's just useful in our line of work. But, you know, the reality is that, you know, sometimes you don't have, you know, you just, you might. Oh, I think we may have lost Joshua temporarily, but yeah. I think we were almost at the end of our spiel anyway. So I think he's coming back. I know while we're waiting. He's come through in the, uh, sorry, Mark. Uh, you you um kind of froze out there for a minute. What were you saying? Did I freeze? A little bit, yeah. Am I still frozen? Sorry about that. Well, I'm glad it's happening kind of near the end of this, but, uh, you know, we've, we've been answering questions in the chat. Um, you know, if, if anybody has any questions now, feel, feel free to unmute. We can show uh, something again, or we can just give our opinion of just things we've, uh, you know, things we've identified as we've been discloring, dis uh, explored, exploring and, these different options. In case everybody missed it before we have questions, John made a really great observation um, about the newest upgrade to Photoshop uh, 2020, which I think we just all recently got if you're on the subscription plan. There's a new feature called Match Font that helps you match to whatever is in the publisher, is in the image. So if you want to read his comment there, that's something I'm looking forward to trying out. Oh, that's amazing. I yeah, love that. It, it's brand new, so it's really exciting. And I think that also has, um, they're, they're kind of moving in that direction with giving more font flexibility, which is nice. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. I was, not, I was not aware of that, but I am very happy to hear that. Um, that that's, that's very cool. Um, yeah, uh, if anybody has uh, any questions, please let us know. You know, we're uh, on the back end of all of this, you know, Again, the, the idea of this presentation is really, you know, creating a template that's very comfortable for you. You know, um, we have made some like just very generic templates, uh, you know, if you're interested in them, you know, um, Mark made a, a, a really, really cool Acrobat template. I made a slightly different one. I'm going to admit it's less cool, but, um, you know, I have a Word one. I have that Dorico one, if that's anything that interests you. So please uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'll, we'll find a way to provide it on, you know, like the MOLA resources page at another point too. But um, uh, any questions before we sign off? No, I just wanted to say that uh, that was a new thing in Photoshop. I haven't tried it, but I thought uh, since somebody had mentioned the fonts for various publishers, that might be something that you could be that you could use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's very very exciting. So I'm definitely going to experiment uh, around with that myself. You know, there's there are a couple websites online that do that. It's like like Font Spring, Maturator, things like that. Uh, you know, I, I imagine it's the same technology. It's just it's just baked into Photoshop, which is just much more useful than opening up uh, an internet tab. But you know, those uh, those um, those those little things can work sometimes. Um, I just wanted to say something else too. I think this was a very interesting uh, round table and I was interested to see what folks are doing these days since I was uh, started out in 1970 and by the time I retired in 2011, I had attended everybody's audition in the orchestra and prepared audition books during that time. and. Uh, some of them were quite large, some of them weren't, but uh, it's, it was, it's a very interesting process. And thanks for putting this, uh, this on. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's really great to have everyone here, you know. Um, uh, we got a question from, from, from Michael. Uh, what image type do you export as when exporting from GIMP Photoshop in order to drop into Word? So, um, the main the main one that I use is TIFF. Um, TIFF can be compressed uh, very well without any any uh, compression loss. 
Uh, so you can you can make it smaller and it'll retain all of its quality. You know, I ultimately speaking, most most of the programs will accept any image that you want. So like if if for some reason, you know, if you're being provided an excerpt by a licensing agent and they've scanned as a JPEG or something, you know, you can pretty much drop it in there. But ideally, if you have the, the image control in Photoshop, you want to do a TIFF, you know, uh, and then you either want to uncompress or you can do uh, an LZW compression to make it smaller. You know, especially if you're dropping it into Word, you know, Word is, you know, ultimately a program designed for words. Uh, and so having a lot of image files in an audition packet can, can make it kind of laggy and responsive. So if you're able to do TIFF with LZW compression when you're exporting from GIMP or Photoshop, um, uh, that, that can help. Um, any other questions? Again, you can write in chat or just un unmute your mic and we're happy to take them. Um, I've got to actually run, um, but I want to thank everybody, especially Joshua and Mark for spearheading this. And of course, Amy Tackett for organizing. Um, I know we're almost at the end, but I have to go, but. No, I completely yeah. understand. Thank you so much, Philip. Okay. Um, yep. Much in that same line, you know, again, the whole world has crumbled around us. Somehow MOLA is still standing with uh, a lot of wonderful presentations that are being spearheaded behind the scenes. You know, there's a whole webinar production team making sure that this is working. The social media accounts are, are, are flying with information. So, you know, please make sure if you have a moment, give thanks to, to Amy, the MOLA board, you know, the association is really trying to make sure that our, our message and our use in our field is, is still available to the world. Um, and so it's, it's thankless work if we don't thank them. So just make sure you, uh, say that. So, you know, additionally, thank you all for being here. Uh, it was very fun to work on these things, uh, and to learn things ourselves. And it's always like a, a point of privilege to then kind of present it and, you know, it just makes us feel good. So, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, please feel free to contact any of us, uh, privately as need be if you have any follow-up questions on your own or if you're interested how we did anything. So, but thank you very, very, very much. We will see you all again soon when hopefully everything's back to normal in Berlin next year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you everyone. And it's been good to see some of your faces.